All right. Good morning, everybody. And when I say morning, I mean evening. That's what I meant. Welcome. I'm tired. <laughs> All right. If you're in the back, go ahead and come on in, find a seat. If you are new with us, thank you so much for coming and trying out a new church. We know that that's really hard normally, especially in COVID season, so thank you. We're excited that you're here. And also, if you're watching for the first time online, welcome to you. We've got three things that we want you to be aware of. Number one is for you, if you're a guest, we have a new system to communicate with you because our, our old paper system um, is harder to do when you can't touch stuff. We have a new uh, system that connects to your phone. So if you are new, take your phone out. It's okay. We'll let you do it right now. You can text S or FBC guest to 94000, and that will send a link to your phone that will give you a little survey. It helps us get to know you, and then one of our pastors will call you within the week. So again, if you're new, text FBC guest to 94000. Next, and this is for everybody, especially if you're new though, we launched an all church Bible study a few weeks ago on Jonah. And there was hundreds and hundreds of people that did it, but we also know that you're either, you might be new or maybe you've been here for a while, but you haven't felt connected. We would love for you to join one of those. It's not too late. So you can, again, hop on your phone and if you text FBC groups, it will give you a link to all of those Bible studies and you can pick the one that works best for your schedule. Or you can hop onto our website and again, find all of those lists and join the group that works for you. Finally, we've got a fun event coming up for our kiddos. We've had a lot change for them. A lot of it has changed for your kids and a lot's been taken away. So we feel that events that are fun and safe and family friendly are more important than ever. So we're gonna throw a trunk or treat coming up October 28th. It's gonna be out here in our parking lot. We're gonna have a bunch of um, cars that are registered. Don't worry, we're gonna know who all of them are. We're gonna have all of them here and we're gonna pass out candies and let your kids come dressed up and have fun. So we need two things from you. Number one, we need cars to sign up for um, the line of cars that are going to be here. And again, we're going, to, we're going to register all of those so you can't just show up and do it. But if you text FBC trunk to 94000, Stephanie, our children's director, will get in touch with you and you can have your car be one of those. We're also giving a prize to the coolest decorated trunk. And secondly, if you want to help, but you don't want to have your car in the parade, that's fine. We need your help getting a bunch of candy for all the kids that are going to be here. So if you want to donate candy, that would be awesome. You can bring it to the church office or contact Steph, and she'll make sure she gets that from you. But again, thank you guys so much for coming. We're going to begin with worship. Good evening, everyone. Let's stand up together and let's worship. the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way for the King. Open up the gates, make way before the King of God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, 
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Say that again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Stop the Lord, our God is light, the light of Judah, he's roaring with power, and fighting our battles, every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that will say, for the sins of the world, his blood breaks. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. 
Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love I feel doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Standing on the rock. It's true and it's great news. Lift your voice and let's sing it together. I am standing on the times do we let our fear get in the way? I know that's true for me. I love the lyrics to that song when I'm so reminded of, I'm standing on the rock. It's my firm foundation. Christ is my rock. What am I afraid of, huh? We serve a good God. Would welcome me. I was lost, but you brought me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Who is free indeed. I'm a child. Slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, who is free in me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. There's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me Oh, I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun says free, who is free. place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. 
I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. You guys can be seated. We're going to teach you a new song. The name of the song is called Stronger, and it's about Christ being stronger. So I'll leave it at that, and you probably won't know the words, and that's fine, but we are going to worship about Christ's strength and his resurrection. recently that told me that worshiping lately was becoming very difficult and he was having a hard time focusing and concentrating just being in this this space and I asked him why and he said that there was so much vying for his attention it was hard to shut it all off we have a lot going on in our minds right now and so as a staff we wanted to give you a moment right now to just pause 
to breathe for a second, and we're going to pray for a number of minutes, and I'm going to give you some prayer prompts. So feel free. If you've never done anything like this before, I know it might feel weird, but you can just sit in silence. You can sit with the person next to you and just begin to pray out loud if you would like to. But we're going to be silent before the Lord for a minute, and we're going to recognize lordship. Because if those few songs were hard for you, if it was hard to sing that you're a child of God because you can't even hear that line in your head, if it was difficult for you to imagine a God who's strong because to you, a virus has seemingly interrupted his, his majesty and his power. If those songs were difficult for you, then this moment is for you. Because we have one more song to sing, and we want you to sing it uninterrupted. So as we begin praying, here's your first prompt. I want you to pray, and I want you to, I want you to ask God to take from you, take from your mind and your heart, all the arguments you've ever had with anyone on COVID or masks. You laugh. You laugh, but this moment is for you. Because you can probably think of someone that you might have been in a heated exchange with, and we don't want that interrupting your worship. So let's pray for a minute. Ask him to help you forgive, help you let it go, help you understand, even with people that you don't agree with. Next, we want you to let go of politics. God is bigger than Trump, and he's bigger than Biden, and he's bigger than this than this election, and if you've been letting it steal your joy, now in this moment, let it go. And finally, let's lift up your kids and your grandkids, their school, and maybe your work. For too long, you've feared about your child's education and it's dwarfing your ability to love people. Or maybe there's tension and fear at work and you're afraid you might lose your job. And to you, work has become bigger than a sovereign God that loves you. Father God, we don't pray about these things because we want to forget them. We don't pray about them because we want to ignore them. They're real and they affect us. Our work is important. How this virus is affecting people, that's important. And who governs this country, that is important. But Lord, please forgive us if we've let any of those things or others get in the way of us abandoning ourselves and worshiping you. You are bigger than our president. You completely decimate any disease or virus. You control all those things. You lead us into jobs and you take us out of them. And so would we never hold too fast to any of those things? We love you and you are so faithful. So in this next song, would we think back to the moments in our lives where you have pulled us through it? 
where you have achieved victory in our lives. And would we sing this last song uninterrupted? In Jesus' name, amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever. Is that not true? If you believe that, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Well, my friends, it's sure good to see you. And for those of you online, in Peru, in Baghdad, wherever else you are, or in bed, 
It's good to see you. People inspire me. They do. I am a professional people watcher. I love watching people, especially people that are motivated, highly motivated, people that are inspiring, they are passionate, they are driven. I love driven people, I do. Um, one of my heroes, all time heroes, I try to become kind of a moderate um, expert in certain individuals' lives. And one of them that um, I try to know a lot about is David Livingstone. He's a Scottish doctor. He uh, went with um, a mission out of England, went to Northern Africa, and uh, probably some of my favorite quotes, if you've hung around me a week, I've probably given you a David Livingstone quote because I'm inspired by them. Um, I quoted David Livingstone when I was doing 57 miles an hour down the Rockies on a bicycle, looking at my little tire, believing at 105 pounds that it was pressured, realizing that if it blew, I was probably in the presence of God. And I kept stating my favorite David Livingstone quote, I'm immortal to the will of God as accomplished in my life. And um, um, I, um, that's one of my favorite quotes. Why? Because I believe that. I'm immortal till God's will is accomplished. And so um, I try not to live recklessly, but when you're doing fast on a bicycle, not motorcycle, a bicycle, and you're going down this hill at 57 some miles an hour. And I know that for professionals, that's nothing. For some of you, you've probably done that in your sleep. But for this old geezer, 57 miles an hour, that's a lot. And um, that's one of my favorite David Livingstone quotes. By the way, he made that quote, I believe, when he was about 106 pounds. Normally, he weighed about 180 pounds, and he, his body was being ravaged, probably with malaria, and he was flat on a gurney, and he was asked, being asked to take from one village to the next. And they said, Sir Livingstone, you're going to die if we take you to the next village. And he said, I'm immortal to the will of God is accomplished in my life. Take me to the next village. And they did. One, another one that I love is if you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. That's my kind of guy. I like that guy or I like that gal. I love people like that. I do. I love people who are tenacious. I love people who have grit. Oh, don't you? Don't you love a person who's like, hey, I don't need a road. Just give me the mission. People talk of the sacrifice that I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. It emphatically is no sacrifice at all. Say rather, it is a privilege. I'm inspired by people like that. I'm inspired by people like the apostle Paul who in this text tells you what drives him. There's a lot of things that drive people. You know them. There's a lot of people who are driven by money. There's a lot of people who are driven by things. There's all kinds of people. A number of years ago, this whole idea of a bucket list came along. And a lot of people had a bucket list. And they all had a bucket. And they put things in their bucket list, things that they wanted. And... Um, I tried to get a bucket list, but my bucket kept having a hole in it, so I gave up on it. And I have nothing wrong with a bucket list. There's, you have them. That's great. I just can't keep track of the thing. But um, to be motivated by something, I think, is really important to have vision and goals and things you want to accomplish. Uh, again, to be not driven in life, I think, is to be pathetic 
It's terrible. I can't imagine living that way. And so when I look at Paul, that's why I said in chapter 1, verse 28, is one of my favorite texts in all of the Bible when Paul says, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And to this end, I labor and struggle with all of the energy that God gives me. That thing gets me out of bed. It does. When COVID drives me nuts and politics makes me mad, I come back to this text because it refocuses me. And so Paul now moves to a point and he wrestles with this question, what's driving me? Now, Paul is the same one who wrote in Colossians. Later, he says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So absolutely, the Apostle Paul would tell you that the glory of God is the single most important factor in his life. But when it comes to the issue of ambition and drive and focus, more specifically under the glory of God, what is it? Verse 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God. What is at the center of Paul's drive? People. And what I think he suggests is this, that the quality of our lives comes down to the quality of our relationships. When it's all said and done for the apostle Paul, the quality of his life comes down to what? People. The people that he pours his life into and the quality of their life. And he identifies three things, three critical things that if you center people that they need that will make their life significant, that they actually need. Not out of sinfulness, but they need every day. The people sitting next to you right now, they need it. The people you're going to go home with tonight, if you live with folks, they need it. The people you're going to have in class tomorrow, they need it. The people that you're going to teach with, they need it. The people you're going to police with, they need it. What? Number one, they need to be encouraged. It's not an easy place to live in the world, not just because of COVID. You could say this 20 years ago. You could say it 50 years ago. People need to be encouraged. That's what Paul said. You could say it 2,000 years ago. He said, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. Why? Because they need it. It's easy to get discouraged in heart. It's easy to get downtrodden. It's easy to get frustrated. In his book, Winning Life's Toughest Battle, Siegel said that daily conversations are actually counseling sessions, giving hope and assurance or reassurance. And he identifies two things that I think people need every day in this idea of encouragement. Two things that people need every day. And without it, they don't live. It's his essential if you will, is there. They need hope. If they don't have hope, they don't have a future. They get, when a person doesn't have hope, they get very damaging to their own life. When I was in Africa, when I was traveling through Africa, I began to look at people in, in, in uh, Mozambique that didn't have a future. It didn't matter how they lived. Their average lifespan at the time when I was there was about 40. And it didn't matter really how they were going to live. And, and uh, whether they lived good or bad in terms of their overall health, their lifespan was about 40. And when that's the case... They, they, it doesn't matter. I, I realized at the time that much of the way we live and how we do things is because we have the hope of a future. 
We take vitamin D. Why? Because it allows us to live better and longer. You take vitamin E oil and you take vitamin C and all of the things you do is taken. Why? Because you believe you can prolong life. What you're doing is instilling the hope of longer life. You intrinsically know, I want hope. People need hope. They do. Paul understands if the quality of the people that I'm going to invest in and they're going to live well, then I have to own my responsibility. I, I don't have the kind of the, the ownership of their life, but the reality is Paul says my purpose is to encourage them, to give them hope. It's a discouraging world that we live in. It can be. It's uncertain. Everyone's got these dire predictions. If Trump wins, we're going to have riots in the street. If Biden wins, we're going to have riots in the street. Wow, hallelujah. If this person wins, man, uh, the stock market's going to crash. If this person wins, and, and they all, you know, on the news, I mean, by and large, they go home every night and say, how can I say things just to scare people to death? People need hope. I've been so utterly delighted in Jonah. So amazed at God to take this recalcitrant pastor, this unwilling spokesman for God, this individual who has not a care in the world for anyone, uh, not even really himself. When the whole ocean is going upside down, he goes down into the bowels of this ship and goes to sleep. How indifferent. The poor sailors up on top, oh, well, God fears, but that's at best, maybe. Throwing things over the edge, trying to live, trying to survive, doing everything they can, caring, having some care and concern for Jonah, and yet not going to survive. And what does God do? He exposes his little rebellious pastor. He gets him over the edge into the water just where he wants him puts him in a whale. You say, ah, I don't believe that garbage. I'm with Evie Hill. You haven't seen all of God's fish. God can find a fish. And he got him just where he wanted him. And you know, my thought was, you know what? If God can take a reluctant pastor and get him to a really barbaric group of people and get them to confess and trust God, Washington, D.C. is a cakewalk for him. Amen? Amen? See, people need hope. They don't need to be told how bad it is. They need to be reminded of how strong God is, how masterful he is, how wonderful he is, how gracious he is, how persistent he is. That's what Paul said purpose of your life, my friends, is to cast a vision every day for the worried people in this world of how glorious their God is. They need hope and they also need reassurance. That's what Siegel said every day in his book, Winning Life's Toughest Battles. They need hope and they need reassurance. They need to hear the words Muriel Anderson heard from her dad when she was writing an assignment when she was in the fifth grade and she uh, was asked by the teacher, what would you like to be when you grow up? She goes, I'd like to be an author. And the teacher said, you could barely write. You're not that good. And she goes home and tells her dad and he gives her, as she said, the four most important words that he gave her. Of course you can, honey. Of course you can. And she began to believe it. And every day he would remind her, oh, Muriel, yes, you can. Of course you can. Yes, you can do it. 
you can make it. When I was studying under Dr. Crabb one time, it was a year long course with him and he would lecture in the morning and then counsel in the afternoon. We got to watch him in the afternoon. <laughs> And he was counseling this lady. And one time he paused for a moment and he was interviewing her and he asked her this question. Do you remember what it was that I said that, that helped you become convinced that, you know, and, and give you the insight? And she goes, yeah, I do. I remember actually very vividly the day that I turned the corner. And, and Dr. Crabb told us later, he goes, I was waiting for this phenomenal insight that I'd given her. And she turned to him and she goes, Dr. Crabb, you put your hand on my shoulder and you looked him in the eyes and you said, you're going to make it. And, and he said to the class, that's all it was? Yeah, you're going to make it. Sometimes, like Joseph Bailey, who wrote the book on A View from the Hearse, after he had done the fifth funeral in his family, he said, I've walked into the raging waters of the Jordan and I have touched bottom. Sometimes it's a person who has walked into the raging waters of the Jordan. They've gone through the tumultuous path of death and they look back and they see a struggling saint and they say to them with the confidence of one who has walked to that path you're gonna make it oh yes you can see Paul says that the quality of your life is measured by the quality of those whom you encourage they need hope they need encouragement and secondly he says I promote unity with among their ranks my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. There's a lot of things that unite people. Might surprise you, but do you remember the day that we were united with the USSR? I know today we're not. They're spying on us and they're doing all kinds of things to our elections. But there was a day that we were united with them. Do you remember what united us? We hated Hitler. Oh, yes, we were absolutely locked, stepped with the USSR. We were their friends, and we trusted them, and they trusted us. Why? Because we had a common enemy that we hated. But I guarantee you, friends, if you trust hatred as your unifying theme, it will give way. It will. It won't hold you together. There's a lot of churches that unite over hatred and something they're against, something that they're going to dismantle. But the reality is hatred, whether it be from countries, from Christian organizations, candidly, even people, hatred will never keep you together. What you're going to destroy will never keep you together. What you will dismantle will never keep you together. What does Paul say? United in love. Jesus is the one who prayed, Father, may they be one just like you and I are one. Do you think that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit get together and say, what can we destroy today? Do you think that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit link arms together and say, oh, what can we dismantle? What can we destroy? What are we against? No. Father, may they be one just like you and I are one. May they have an affection for each other just like we have an affection for each other. That's what Paul said. I want to promote that. I want to build that. I want to, I want to build that into their hearts. Unity and love go hand in hand. It does. And if your unity is built upon the precarious nature of destruction, what you're against, it won't sustain you. If your unity is built upon something that is rigid, it won't sustain you. If it's built upon love, oh, it will. If it's built upon an interdependence, something of an intertwined strength, oh, it will strengthen you. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 5 and following talks about an interdependence. We belong to each other. I love aspen groves, oftentimes because you'll see a score of aspen together and they will tell you that it's probably or more likely than not one tree system. I didn't know this until I began to study them, but redwoods are in some ways the same way. They're not one tree system, but redwoods that can oftentimes get to be the height of 300 feet have some of the shallowest root systems for trees. I'm always a little frightened at my house. We have some oak trees. They're huge. Some of the guys in our church that know trees have told me they probably are in the vicinity of 225, 250 years. I'm fine with it. I have nothing against age until the wind blows. And then I look at those things and I think, how close are those? And one time we had a really just wicked windstorm and I moved my truck. I thought, you know, if it comes down, I really don't want the hassle of to have to get another truck. They're big. They scare me. They are 300 feet in the air. Their root systems, they say, are as large under the ground as what I see above the ground. And they go down deep, not redwoods. They just travel along the surface of the ground. So what gives them their strength? They intertwine their roots with each other. They share their strength with each other. Interestingly enough, those closest to water share with those furthest from water. It's almost like God wants us to have a picture of the body of Christ. You see, that's the unity that he wants to see here. To be quite honest with you, there's a sense of which we're all weak. Not because we're shallow people, but our root system's really not all that deep. We're not meant to be standalone people. We're meant to be intertwined. We're not meant to have to go it all alone. We're meant to be a hand connected to the arm, connected to the eye. We're meant to be interdependent, to need each other. And when we're intertwined, we're strong. That's what Paul says I want to build in. Why? Because I want to promote unity. Because that's what builds you. And one of the things that we're going to have to redevelop in this era is the ability to trust each other. Because we've been divided over so many things in the last six months. The ability to welcome each other into our hearts because we have fought over so much. And so Paul says, my friends, my purpose is to develop the quality of our lives by encouraging you, by promoting unity, and by building strength. He says... At the end of this, in whom are hidden all the treasures and the wisdom of knowledge. And I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you and delight to see how orderly and how firm your faith is. What's his goal? To encourage them to promote their unity and to strengthen their faith. How does he do that? To build it upon the word of God, to make them strong, to make them able to withstand those false teachings that come along the way. 
I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Over the years, I've seen some of those. I've seen a lot of those, actually. A number of years ago, there was a movement that was happening in India. And people called, Pastor, there is a work of God in India, and if we don't get involved in it, we're not going to be a part of the greatest work of God. We need to send money. I'm always hesitant to use God's money, the church's money, to invest in people I don't know. Oh, but it started spreading across the evangelical framework and it was going to be something that swept India. Time came and went and we found out that it wasn't a great work of God. It was a hoax. But it stripped the body of Christ of millions. There was another one that came. Oh, I'll tell you, we were in a building program in the church that I was in, and oh, pastor, this is going to finish the building program. We're going to be able to build something far more. If we just take this amount of money, focus on the family, pastor has done it. Young life has done it. We've got to do it. And it is going to be the most incredible thing. Well, all we have to do is take $250,000 and it's going to turn into a million dollars, pastor, if we do it. But we've got to do it now. I was hesitant. But I tell you, when you hear focus on the family's done it, and when you hear young life's done it, you kind of feel like if you don't do it, you're kind of an idiot. But man, I had that check in your spirit. I'm in Utah. I'm sitting in a hotel room getting ready to speak the next day. And the news breaks out. It's a Ponzi scheme. Hundreds of organizations have been scammed. Pastors discredited, some go to jail. I could go for hours of the things that we in the body of Christ have seen. Paul understood. He didn't want to turn us into a bunch of cynics. He didn't want to turn us into a bunch of skeptics. But he did understand that there would be a lot of deception that would come down the pike. And John Wesley understood that there have to be some criteria of test. And so John Wesley knew that there had to be the test of Scripture. Does what you're hearing stand up against the Word of God? Does what you're hearing stand up against the test of church history, orthodoxy? Does this new phenomenal insight that you're hearing, does it, does it have a ring of orthodoxy against what the church has preached and taught for 2,000 years? And does it come up against the test of reason? Does it make sense? And Wesley said, if it doesn't pass all three of those, most notably number one, be suspicious, be patient. Why? Because one of the gifts that Paul wanted to build into people was what? Discernment. And the quality of the relationships that he wanted to build were people who were encouraged in heart, unified in love, but wise as serpents. Let me tell you what, those people endure. They make it. The quality of our lives comes down to the quality of our relationships. And when you build those kind of people, they endure. They do. They endure through COVID. They endure through rough political seasons. They endure through these times 
when the church gets a little prickly and times get hard, and they are hard right now. But my friends, when you get up in the morning, you're going to have to ask yourself the question, Paul did every day, what drives me? And I got news for you. I have no idea how long this craziness is going to last. But the purpose that I live with every day hasn't changed. A year ago, my purpose was the same. To build into the lives of people that they might be encouraged in heart, strengthened in love, secure in their faith. And that assignment hasn't changed. And my friend, I want to commend it to you. That's your assignment. What's driving you? Let's pray. Gracious God, when you take us out of here today, when you call us into this next week, whatever vocation, location, we serve, we live, we work. Open our eyes to the people who need to be encouraged, to those who are on the fray being pulled away in division, and to those whose faith is weakened, we have a job to do. We have a privilege and an honor to serve them. And we have tools to work with with your word. And we have life-giving power with your spirit. Send us to the glory of God. Send us. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, to be with you, well, it's the best gift in the world. I love you. God bless you.